And welcome to the Codex Cantina, where I am Una. And I am Unknown Crypto. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> we come at you today with the short story, or maybe novella, based on how long it is. I, it seems like a little questionable to me. Uh, Letters of an Unknown Woman by Stefan Spock. And we'd like to thank Kaja for picking the story for us tonight, as this is one of the privileges for being on a special tier of our patron. You get to pick one story a month that we read. And so thank you very much. We appreciate it. And we start off with publication information. Letter from an Unknown Woman was published in 1922. And our copy was translated by Anthea Bell. Now, I didn't realize when we started this that we kind of stumbled into quarantine lit in a sense. Did you pick up on that? No, I didn't originally. And I was teaching my students about the bubonic plague. And we started making connections between the next major pandemic, the Spanish flu, and then relating it to COVID. And I went back and I was like, wait a minute what happened in this story and one of the characters dies of the Spanish influenza. Yeah, yeah, I didn't pick up on it till much later either. Now, this is a story on unrequited love. It's a story about obsession. Uh, there's a lot to talk about with this piece, but we can't go without saying that Sveig's writing... Uh, I actually wanted us to start with chess story, but I kept kind of booting it. My fault on the schedule side. And this came this came up for this selection. But Sveig's writing is very... Um, he's one of those authors that can just get you into a trance. It's very easy to consume. There's really no point when you're reading this, you're like, what's going on? Uh, you may not know all the answers, but you're like, I know I don't know the answer to this. He's, he's very good at leading the reader down a course uh, of inquiry, a line of inquiry, if you will. And I think he does that by making it very passionate and very raw and a sense of relatability to the characters or in this case the loss of a character that all of us can you know latch on to and it just pulls you down this very emotional story and I think that is something that is beautifully done here. And the last thing I would say actually is have you ever read The uh, Sorrows of Young Werther? No, I haven't heard of that one. It's th this gives me a lot of those feelings, but maybe even a bit more mature than the way that one's written. It's it's also about that one's more about a man and it's commentary on romanticism in the time period. Much, much different. Like I, I, I think we can talk about romanticism with this one, but the time period is much later than than Goethe's work. But uh, it's also about a person with monomania, obsessed with a woman, infatuation and um, letting one's emotions dictate where they go, which can ultimately be very dangerous. All right, let's move us on into plot then, and we'll have to read that one in the future. We'll do a comparison of them two maybe then once we have that information. All right, so plot, R, a novelist. He returns home on his 41st birthday and opens a letter with unfamiliar handwriting. An unknown woman tells him in this letter that her son has died. She has no one to tell it to besides R, and she says 15 to 16 years ago when she was 13 is when she met him and goes through the story of how... You know, there's this aura of when he's moving in and how she met his manservant uh, at the door. And it kind of builds up the allure of, of this man that just moved into their neighborhood. And she kind of fell in, in her words, in love with him. Uh, this is where the Fatuation. monomania, the Infatuation. obsession. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Obsession, not love. Well, it's, it's... In my opinion, in my opinion. It's it's Sveig's writing where he describes it as nourishment to her soul, where there's 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 what the narrator is aware of and her view on things and i and i think Zweig does a good job of perspective of of getting into that character's mind to to do this story from a monomania perspective uh, but one day her mother accepts a, a marriage proposal and she has to move away narrator tells us how she had to get a job to earn her own living and eventually kind of sneaks her way back to meet the man again R. And key thing being meet. She's 18 years old and, and actually meeting him for the first time, if you will, at this point in time. And they ask, you know, he asks her out. They go back to her place. They have sex, I think, three times total. And uh, that's kind of it until she realizes that she's pregnant with that man. And she hadn't been with anyone else. So she knows that it's his child. And so she kind of raises this uh, child in, in poverty. She has to go to a special maternity ward to be able to take care of it. She has to kind of start hanging out with men and kind of uh, the modern term would be, uh, what do you call it? The Gold sugar, digging. sugar daddy. Sugar, Get sugar well, daddies. Yeah. For, yeah. yeah. So she, she survives off these other men that are more wealthy to kind of pay her way. 
And eventually she uh, is at a club and runs into him and they hook up again. Only this time he sneaks some money into her muff, realizing that he thinks she's a prostitute. Like he doesn't even remember her. Yeah, he doesn't remember her. Oh, that's got to be harsh. It's like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh, no. Yeah. And, and this girl, she turned down marriage proposals from other men. Like she's desirable in a sense. Yeah, because so, she's still, quote, in love with him. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Spanish flu hits, long story short, and unfortunately her son passes away. Their their child passes away. And to your point, um, the in the same way that there's monomania with her, throughout this whole story, we keep coming back repetitiously to the, your son died, my son died. Like, we keep coming back to this exclamation point, and then we tell some more story. Exclamation point, and we tell more story. So she finishes with you know my son died and this letter wasn't to be delivered to you until i also have passed away leaving us to imply that she has died and um are the guy kind of unaffected in a sense <laughs> oh yeah he just i feel like he just folded up the letter grabbed a cigarette and a drink and went back to his study or library or manservant i don't know he just kind of he's impartial to it like he doesn't even care right and with with Girta's story, it is about. It, I, I think it's a commentary on romanticism too. Um, it's been a while. I don't even know what year it came out now, but I think it was in that era. But it's a commentary on when emotions lead you to move forward. It's a commentary on class. Uh, it's a commentary on a person's individual coming of age moment. And I think we see elements of that in the story. I, I don't think it's the exact point. I think Svig kind of. Uh, matures the character, matures the point of view, but ultimately we may have some of the same quirks in this character driving her forward. So for me, I know that the big takeaway is the religious aspect of it, and there's a lot to this story, but I think there's a little tiny bit of nugget in there on the class distinction of the haves and have the nots. It's, it's sprinkled throughout. I don't know. I, I might have had a stronger class one, but I just think the religious side's more interesting, honestly. But in terms of the have and have nots, right, like, this is a woman, like, we, particularly we see it really hit you in the face when she has the child. But even from the beginning of the story, like you said, it being sprinkled throughout, we have that quote, Before you moved into our building, a familiar of ugly, mean-minded, quarrelsome people lived behind the, the door of your apartment. Poor as they were, what they hated most was the poverty of next door. Ours. And then she goes on to talk about manners and how the manners were more important to them and then the class was more important to the other people. And I think this might have been the main thrust for me is what what is it that caused this man to never acknowledge her? Right? They slept together four times, I believe, in the story. Three when she was 18 and then one as the you know pseudo-prostitute when she's older. And what is it that caused the neighbors to despise uh, her and her family? And, and a lot of that comes down to class. And what are the things that, that this man couldn't see? He couldn't see people below him is kind of one of the ways that I took it. And it's her ability to climb up in class isn't what she wanted, right? She wasn't class conscientious the way I think other people were. And I think we see that with the way that she turns down the other men that would have taken care of her. And that was the, the kicker for me was... Obviously, this lady is charming. This lady is somewhat attractive as all these very wealthy men are taking care of her and she's not an exact prostitute, but they are giving her gifts and paying for things. And we don't know. It's implied that she's with them with them, but it must be something that is keeping these men from convincing her for marriage. And that may be the love aspect of it. But even then... There, there seems to be something that maybe it isn't just her choice of why they would never allow her to be you know, part of that uh, echelon of society. Well, maybe it's even a question of would you rather would you rather someone need you or would you rather someone want you? Yeah. And I think the relationship between her and some of those men might be that of need more so than want. And the relationship between her and R is one of want as opposed to need. And he has no need of her, but that's his priority. She wants him, but that they, they just don't have that in common. And that's part of the divide that these classes have. Is even if they are compatible, there's a mismatch of what's their priority in life. Now, we always want what we can't have. <laughs> so moving into the religious stuff. Okay, so he's... <laughs> He's gone for three days and comes back on his birthday, right? Like, that's the opening of this this novella, right? 
hmm, where have I heard somebody going away for three days and then rising back, <laughs> yeah. coming back? All right, so, so let's just yeah. go through this because it's one thing for it to be dropped once, right? For an author to repeatedly throw it into their work, they're wanting you to, I think, look at that maybe draw allusions to it but we we have the woman sat on the chair for three or four hours they had sex three times when they first met right uh the random man that was trying to to marry her the the relationship of need as opposed to relationship of want uh, he asked her to marry him the there three or four times to get the son into the academy in terms so three if you didn't know what crypto is referring to is is how many days between jesus's death and resurrection also, another number that's very popular in the Bible is 40, right? And the woman sat 40 hours by her son's bed who had influenza. And then guess what happens? On the third evening, I collapsed. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It, 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 it's so blatant. So what, what is he doing with this then, right? Well, well first of all, I, of it? I think we need to talk about Zweig's past. We're not scholars. We haven't read a biography on him as far as I haven't, at least. But it's interesting of note is that he was raised with a Jewish family he did believe in pluralism. He did believe in unity and like, you know, like kind of like that freedom sort of thing. So he definitely had an open view, but I don't think he was like strict, you know, Jewish practicing, if you will. But it's also worth noticing, like, why choose the resurrection, particularly coming from a Jewish background, right? Like, usually we think of that as more of a, a Christian or, or well, not just Christian, but not Jewish specifically because Judaism doesn't, it, it it doesn't believe in the resurrection of Christ, but it does know that that resurrections exist, right? That's in Book of Ezekiel, I think it is, correct? Is that Lazarus? No, it's the the valley the valley of the dry bones. It's it's a oh, real okay, yeah, 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 yeah. It, it's a real brief passage, right? But it is there. That is Old Testament, so that is studied. But I think I think we see um, an interesting musing of resurrect resurrection in the story, right? He's coming back. After three days being gone, we have all these references to three days and the 40 days, 40 nights thing. And you'll notice, too, also the white roses, right? You get four white roses at the bedstand, right? There was a candle on each corner. And again, okay, four, four candles. Where have I heard that before? For those Christians that celebrate Advent, they know about the four weeks. The, the sun Was it Sundays leading up to Christmas, leading up to uh, birthdays, resurrection, et cetera, et cetera? And then, oh, wait, oh. We started on his birthday, and the woman talks about how she had faith in him. She celebrated him. She celebrated his uh, b- uh, birthday. Um, I think I think they said the word celebration, and I couldn't help it in my mind be like, well, do you call this celebration Easter? Because that's what it sounds like to me. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> that's but funny. also, this now this one might be a bit of a stretch, but just give the just give me the entertainment on this one. Did you think okay. about the roses? Why may, Why would Zweig decide to make them white? Oh, for purity, the white lamb. Here's another one. What color chasuble does the priest wear on the day of resurrection for Sunday Mass? Easter. Yeah, the, where's the white one? He That's wears the a white chasuble. supposed to wear that, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So kind of interesting the way that he's laced in all of these things about resurrection, rebirth, reborn. And why do you think... Because this is the biggest question I have when going down this line of inquiry, right? So if an author is going to give that to you, give you all these hints, he's pro- he's probably trying to lead you somewhere. Why does you think he's kind of exploring this obsession and resurrection in this story? I don't know if he's questioning his own faith or the validity of Christianity, but it it's peculiar that Jesus doesn't have a earthly father, so the son doesn't know his actual real dad. He knows it's God in the Christian faith, and this child doesn't know his father either. Mm. And I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure where Spike wanted us to go. I agree he wanted us to draw parallels to Jesus, right? Because, one, this woman talks about how she put faith into him, how she became mad at God but asked him for forgiveness, right? And if we think about how Jesus, you know, his, his stories in the Bible is that he spent a lot of time with the destitute, with the poor. There's that class thing again. He helped out the people that needed the help, right? He, he specifically sought them out and taught praisings to them. And here's this man who has the wealth and has the resources and isn't doing that. He's avoiding that. He is the one that is 
ignorant to those that need it. He sees the prostitute and ig- uh, we're calling her a prostitute. That's not totally fair, but in the story of illusions, Ish. Ish. yeah, we can make that comparison, right? From a, from a fictional standpoint and say, okay, he's ignoring the prostitute as opposed to Jesus who took care of them and looked out for them and tried to give them help. Is this a story about class and a story about the chance of rebirth and whether we do or don't help those that need the help and that sort of thing is kind of one of the things that maybe I tied it together, but I don't know. What were your thoughts? I was looking for redemption. I knew that this wasn't a hero's journey story or a true redemption story from R, but I did think that he would be moved by the letter for the loss of an unknown child. I thought that, you know, maybe he would reflect back upon his time with the narrator and realize his, you know, misgivings and be able to become a better person. But there's none of that. It doesn't happen. So maybe... The point of the story, in my opinion, is that we hope for redemption for people, but they're not going to get it, even if they have good religious beliefs and convictions, that you can be this good religious person and not necessarily become a better person because of it. And the, the, the woman is kind of pointing this out about this guy that he could have made better choices and, and been a father and a husband to her and she could have made him happy and they could have had a life and it doesn't happen out. It just doesn't happen. Agreed. You know, and she had devotion to him. I thought it was interesting. How old was she when she met R? She was 13. How many disciples did Jesus have? Right. And we have, we have very clear like comparisons to her following him. So I think it's a good story. You can just enjoy it and maybe not go down the rabbit hole of illusions and comparisons that we have. But I think it is definitely fun and an interesting way to look at it and and maybe a way for you to look at, too, of what does it mean when someone wants versus needs something? And then how do we evaluate how we take care of uh, other people in our lives might be a learning lesson for me. So I I will say it was a fun story. I will leave a link down to Zweig's uh, playlist down below where we'll have other Stefan Zweig uh, and I'm sure my pronunciation is terrible. I apologize. But <laughs> we'll have other talks. We never claim to pronounce anything correctly. Yeah, I've done chess story. You need to do chess story because I, I really like that one. And I think that's a really good place to start with with him as well. So I'll leave that. Playlist I'll talk down to the below. schedule guy. Yeah, let's move into our wrap up and ratings. What would you think about this one? Uh, I don't want to give this one a a number because I think that it is very subjective on your personal religious beliefs and how much you can pull out of it. Um, I do think that from our conversations that Zweigler has better stories, and I know that there is a movie of this um, letter from an unknown woman that was made in like 1942. And it's revered as one of the best movies of the 1940s. And that's one of like kind of the golden ages of Hollywood cinema. And it's revered sometimes in the top 100 movies of all time um, with uh, Joan Fontaine as the lead. And if you're looking for this, maybe watch the two hour movie and watch a classic movie that's considered one of the greatest films of all time instead. Um, so there, there's that option as well. And then maybe read this to get a little bit of flavor for the source material of where that movie comes from. Um, so I know a lot of times people will read and then they'll watch the movie and there's a certain appreciation. Maybe this time watch the movie and then read and have a different appreciation. Uh, you know, change it up on yourself a little bit. Oh, that'd be cool to check out. I think you just said 1942. I think that's the year that he committed suicide too, interestingly enough. Whoa, I'd be interested, I'd be inter- yeah, I'd be interested to know, did the movie come first or did his suicide come first? Uh, Ooh, and, and did he of, hate the movie that much? <laughs> it's revered <laughs> as like one of the greatest films ever. No, no, there's a long lead up to that. This isn't the story or oh. I think the talk for us to go into that. But uh, yeah, okay. yeah he, he's got a, I know very little about his, his life and what led up to that. So, okay. All right, guys. We're going to leave that playlist down below. Like I said, hit that subscribe button to join us on more literature discussions. We look forward to seeing you on the journey. Una out. And of course, one last time, we want to thank Kaja for the suggestion this month of our Patreon choice of the month. Peace.